I hope you have a Bible, and I hope you'll turn in your Bible to John chapter 20. John chapter 20 is where we're going to begin our lesson this morning. John chapter 20. Have you ever had anyone continue to just say the same thing to you because they thought it was so important? They just thought they needed to continue to get the emphasis across? Uh, my dad taught me how to shoot a gun growing up. And almost every time we got together and we were shooting a gun, he would give me the same sermon, I would call it. It was the follow-through sermon. Uh, and he would tell me, well, when you're shooting a gun, even after the gun goes off, you still need to be looking at the same exact spot, at least in your mind, even if your eyes aren't actually there. Keep looking at that same spot. Don't take your head away as soon as you pull the trigger. Follow through. He could have talked about you know, breathing techniques or my stance or my cheek weld, things like that, but, but he thought that follow-through was important, uniquely important. John's gospel is unique for several reasons. We, we tend to call the other gospels the synoptics because they're so similar. But John is unique in several ways. And one of those ways is that he's very nice to give us a very clear thesis statement, what he wants us to learn from his gospel. And this comes in John chapter 20, beginning in verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John wrote his gospel so that we would believe in Jesus, not, not just believe in him, but that he would be, that he's the Christ and the Son of God, and that we would have life in his name, not just a beating heart. John wants us to have eternal life. John's also unique because of his depiction of Jesus himself. The first thing that probably comes to your mind is how he's very specific about Jesus being deity, how Jesus is God. That's how he opens up his gospel, not with a genealogy or stories about Jesus' life. It's this whole thing about the Word was with God and was God and became flesh. Jesus is God. But another thing that's unique to John is how he portrays Jesus going about doing his miracles and the actions that Jesus performs. John doesn't want you to think of Jesus as some superman that's coming down to lift the house above his head and to be wowed, and that's why I'm going to listen to Jesus. No, his miracles have a meaning behind them. John will call them signs because they're pointing to a reality, towards the truth. And the way John even lays this out is unique because he likes sevens a lot. And so he has seven I am statements and seven discourses of Jesus and seven signs. And in the very middle of those seven, it's a particular miracle that is the only one, besides the resurrection, that is in all four Gospels. Why do they keep repeating the same miracle? Why did John put it right in the middle of his signs? It's because it was really, really important. The miracle we're talking about this morning is the feeding of the 5,000. And that comes in John chapter 6. I hope you'll turn with me to John chapter 6. Most of us are probably pretty familiar with this miracle. Actually, for most Christians, it's kind of nostalgic. We, we, we love to think about the feeding of the 5,000. We, we don't know exactly how it happened, what all the logistics were, but we were pretty sure that it looked really cool and people had smiles on their faces. We, we love this miracle. Everyone's getting fed. Uh, but do we know the meaning behind the miracle? Have we seen the sign that's John's questions for us. But before we jump into the, the text, let's think about how we got here just very quickly. Jesus is essentially at the peak of his ministry at this point. This is as popular as Jesus is going to be. This is the height of it. And just before this in chapter 5, Jesus got done performing another sign, another miracle. He healed a man by the pool of Bethesda. But the Jews weren't so excited about that because Jesus did it on the Sabbath. And so he picks up his bed and walks on the Sabbath. And that kind of starts this little scuffle between Jesus and the Jews. And at the very end of chapter 5, Jesus is giving them a specific criticism. And he tells them, you, you say you follow Moses? But Moses wouldn't even recognize you if he was here. If you really follow Moses, you would follow me. Because Moses wrote about me. So right before we jump into chapter 6, Jesus has made a connection between Moses and him. If we follow Moses, we should follow Jesus. Let's begin reading in verse 1. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. 
Lifting up his eyes then and seeing what a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. Also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Let's walk through this passage and see if we can get the message of this sign. The first thing I want to point out is the setup for this sign. The, the, the setting, first of all. In the first few verses, we get all this language about where Jesus is going. First, he crosses a sea. And then after he crosses the sea, he comes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And the other Gospels kind of help us with this. But this is a desolate place. There's no animals. There's no people. It's just, it's just desolate. Why is Jesus going to a, a desolate place? So, so he crosses the sea and he goes to this desolate place. And then he goes up on a mountain crosses a sea, goes into a wilderness, if you will, and then he goes up a mountain. And then John gives us an important detail in verse 4. He says, now the Passover was at hand. Why did John say that? He's the only one that says that. Why did he point out the Passover? Is it just a time marker? No. No, this is how John sets us up for his sign. He does this throughout his gospel. He'll portray Jesus doing these miracles and these signs around certain festivals because he wants you to think about the meaning of the festival and compare that to the sign he's about to give. Passover. When John says that, he doesn't just think about that one night, that one event. It's the whole Exodus event that he wants you to think about. What comes to mind when you think Exodus? But for the Jews, it was the great story of redemption. This is when the nation of Israel was freed. In fact, they weren't even a nation before this. They were just a bunch of slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh. But then came Moses. Then came Moses speaking the word of the Lord. Then came Moses who stood up to Pharaoh. Then came Moses who led the people out of Egypt, who lifted up his staff and by the power of God split the sea in two. Then came Moses who alone ascended to the mountain by himself to the glory of God. Moses who brought an exodus and new life to the people. Do you remember what also happened in those Exodus events, even, even while they were following Moses? Soon after they crossed the Red Sea, the people start complaining. They start complaining quite a bit. They, they say, actually, now that we're in this barren land, in this wilderness, we, we don't even have any food. We have no food to feed us. God, why did you bring us here just to kill us? I'd rather be back in Egypt. We at least had enough food to eat. And what does God do? He feeds them bread, manna, and meat, quail. God provides for his people in the wilderness bread and meat. And notice what we read in Exodus 16. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as they could eat. They were satisfied. God was able to satisfy his people in a barren land. Why does John want us to think about the Passover? Why does John want us to think about the Exodus? It's because Jesus is the new prophet. Jesus is the new Moses. Jesus crossed the sea and went to a wilderness and went up on a mountain just like Moses did. Jesus is the one bringing new life to the people and is the one that can satisfy his people in a barren land. Jesus is the new Moses. That's the setup. Now let's look at the test. Later on, we see that Jesus looks at this crowd, and he he turns to Philip. He says, Philip, where are we going to buy bread? Where where are we going to buy bread for all these people, Philip? And in case we didn't know, John told us he did this in order to test Philip. This was a test. He knew what would happen. And so here's Philip, you know, over here twiddling his thumbs, and Jesus taps him on the shoulder. And uh, he says, Philip, you you know, we need need to feed these people. Just to appreciate this, the text tells us there were 5,000 men. 
Likely that meant with women and children, there were somewhere between 15 and 20,000 people that day. Just to give you a little perspective, uh, Dallas Mavericks, uh, American Airlines Arena, max capacity is 20,000. The crowd would have filled the building. And, and here's Jesus saying, Philip, wh 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 what McDonald's are we going to drive through to feed this whole arena of people? And Philip's like, are you kidding me? If I had an eight-month advance on my salary, I couldn't get even all of them a French fry. There, there's no way I can do this. I mean, can't can you just feel the, the helplessness that Philip was feeling at this moment? Haven't you been there? Haven't you been there as a parent? As a spouse? As a Christian? What am I going to do? How, how do I fix this problem? How do I get through this? I don't have the power. I don't have the ability. I don't have the resources. Have you felt like there's 20,000 people to feed and you have no bread? That's what Philip felt. Uh, actually, the same thing happened to Moses in the wilderness. Uh, in, in the story, we, we read that Moses comes into this wilderness, and there's a moment where the people are asking Moses, won't you provide us meat to eat? We want some meat, Moses. And Moses is just completely, doesn't know what to do about the situation. In Numbers 11, verse 13, where am I to get meat to give to all the, this people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. But Moses is complaining to God about the complaint of Israel. He says, they want meat and I have nothing to give them. In fact, Moses is so distressed that in a few verses, he's, gonna, he's going to ask God, if this is how it's going to be leading Israel, just kill me. Just end it. I'm done. Have you been there? I just can't handle this anymore. I can't do this. How does God respond to Moses? Well, first, he, he, gives them, he gives them 70 men to help him with the task. And then he says, Moses, guess what? You're not going to provide the people with meat. You know why? Because I'm going to do it. I'm going to provide the meat for the people. And do you know what Moses has the audacity to do? He questions God. He says, God, really? There's at least 600,000 of us in the wilderness right now. You think you can feed us all meat? He says, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill all the cows and the goats, all of our flocks? How about if you took every single fish out of the sea? Maybe then there would be enough. Could you do that, God? How does God respond? Numbers 11, verse 23, And the Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's hand shortened? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. You don't trust me, Moses? Are you kidding me, Moses? Did you forget what happened back in Egypt? Did you forget the signs? Did you forget me splitting a sea in two? Are you kidding me, Philip? Do you remember what happened back at the wedding? Do you remember the man I healed at the pool? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me, Jansen? You don't trust me? When the going gets tough? Don't you remember what I've done for you? Are you kidding me? It's so easy, isn't it, to be like Philip, to be like Moses. We fail at the test so often, don't we? Why? Because we're in a barren land. And all we're seeing is the physical in front of us, just the earthly. What does it take to pass the test? A few things, I think. Number one, you have to realize you're insufficient. You must realize you can't do this. Did Jesus want Philip to fix the problem? No. <laughs> he didn't expect Philip to feed all those people. He wanted Philip to see that he couldn't fix the problem so that he would turn his eyes to Jesus. John is unique in his gospel. He says nothing about the disciples doing anything in, the, in his passage. The, the disciples don't distribute the food. Jesus alone in John's gospel. He wants your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is the one doing this. Jesus is the one fixing the problems. We don't fix the problems on our own. God must fix the problems. That's what he wanted Philip to see. That Philip couldn't fix it. He wants us to see that we can't fix it on our own. Not so we get overwhelmed. Not so we get worried and distressed. So that we look to God and we notice not only that God is sufficient, but number two, that God is abundant. That God is abundant in what he can provide. Do you believe that God can provide what you need this morning? Not what you want, we're going to get there. You believe he can provide what you need? Or do we think more like Philip? 
you know, I, I've seen Jesus do some things before, and I know he has power, but, but I, I don't know if I can trust him on this one. I, I think I might need a little more. Can you show me something else, Jesus? I, I think there's, there's something more I might need. And Jesus is saying, you need more? You need more, Jansen? No. No, John says, I could have written volumes. I could have written books that would have filled all the libraries up, but I just wrote this. Why? So that you may believe. We, we don't need more miracles. We don't need more proof. We need more faith. We need more faith. So you can look in your little child's eyes when they're dimming. You can have hope. You can give them hope, even though the cancer seems too strong. We need more faith so we stop finding peace in our 401k and find it in God. We need more faith so when the police come knocking, this might not be too far away, by the way. When the police come knocking and they say, are you teaching against homosexuality? You can say, yes, I am. Not because I hate people, but because I love them. And I follow the Bible. And that's not changing today. So do what you have to do. We need more faith. Philip was positive about what he couldn't do. They had no idea. Before we get to the sign, a couple more things I want to point out to you. Notice that it says in the text that there was much grass. Don't just kind of skip over that. The picture is that anywhere Jesus is, is life. Even in this desolate place, there's much grass where Jesus is. And then we get this detail about what Jesus does before he performs the sign. He gives thanks. Is that a big deal? Is giving thanks a big deal? Yeah, it's a really big deal. Actually, it was such a big deal that it kept Moses out of the promised land. Do you remember how the story goes? God asks for Moses to speak to the rock. And Moses stands there with his brother Aaron and he says, shall we bring water from this rock, this rock for you all? Shall we do it? And then he strikes it. And notice what God tells Moses. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. God says, you didn't believe in me, Moses. How does, how does that make sense in this context? Notice how he describes it. You didn't uphold me as holy. You didn't treat me as holy, Moses. You didn't treat me like I'm the God that provides everything. You acted like you're the one that provides for everything. You didn't uphold me as holy, Moses. Do we give thanks? This is more than just praying before a meal. Who provides for your family? How does that discussion go when, when there's something to purchase or a big decision to make and there's you know, some pushback and what needs to be decided? Who, who makes that decision? Now, if you're the head, if you're the husband of the family, you're the leader, you're the head of the family, but, but is it you that provides for your family? Really, you, you alone, you do it all. You're the one that provides for the family. No. No, God provides. God provides. Everything we have, every breath we take, everywhere we've been, everything we've accomplished, it's from God. God is the one that provides, not us. Giving thanks is a big deal. Giving thanks is how we recognize that it's God, not us. It's a lifestyle of humility that says everything I have and everything I am is not from myself. It's from God. Jesus, Jesus could have got ready to perform this sign and kind of puffed his chest out, you know, and said, you know, you know all you people out here, this is pretty desolate out here. Do you guys need some food to eat? Uh, you, you guys hungry? Anybody hungry? Do, do you believe that I can do it? Uh, what, what, there's some haters out there? There's some doubters? Oh, let, let me just show you what I can do. No. No, he points them to the Father. The Son of God pointed them to the Father. Show them that it's God that provides. Jesus gave thanks. Now let's see the sign. We read that Jesus takes this little boy's lunch. Now, now don't think when you read bread and fish, don't think like five giant artisan loaves and you know, two, two fish thrown over the kid's back. You know. No, we're, we're like five little barley pancakes and a couple little sardines. Jesus takes this kid's sack lunch Okay, and what does he do with it? it? John just says, he just distributes it. He just hands it out. 
That's it. How did it look? What are the logistics? We don't know. John, John doesn't care. Jesus handed it out. And he fed them. Are you kidding me? That's amazing. Jesus took a Happy Meal and he fed the Daver- Dallas Maverick Stadium. This is amazing. We've never seen something like this. Jesus fed the people. Well, surely, you know, maybe, okay, they each got like a chicken nugget or something, right? I mean, how much did they really have? No, the end of verse 11 tells us they ate as much as they wanted. Can you imagine this? I can just imagine if there's a little family and, you know, the, the, the food's getting passed around and it's coming to them and uh, they're, they're getting a little bit and the little boy there is like, oh, oh, mom, can I have some more? Can I have some more food, please? And mom's like, now wait a second, little Josephus. There's 10,000 people behind us. You got to wait your turn. Okay, let's wait. And I can just imagine Jesus just, just looking over do you need more? Do you need some more? There's plenty. There's plenty here. Guys, get, get them some more. You can have as much as you want. I could feed you forever. The people had as much as they wanted. This is a picture of life. John, one of his favorite words is life. He begins the book with it, saying that Jesus is life. And in the thesis statement in John 20, the purpose of this gospel is to have life. This miracle, this sign is a picture of life with God. The people are with God. And it's like an Eden-like picture. They're in grass and there's water nearby. And they're completely satisfied. It's true life, abundant life, eternal life. That was the sign. But the people don't get it. Read with me in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Look in your Bible with me. John 6, verse 25. Jesus had left to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and now the people kind of meet up with him again, wondering where he's gone. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on Him, God the Father has set His seal. The people weren't seeking Jesus for the right reason. The people were seeking Jesus to fill their bellies. And Jesus told them, stop. Stop looking for physical food and look for the eternal food that I can give you. Jesus didn't come to feed people physically. Jesus didn't come to supply the poor for an evening. He came to supply the poor in spirit with eternal life. The sign of the feeding is a picture of abundant life we have with Jesus, but the crowd can't see it because they have the same problem that the disciples had. All that they see is what's right in front of them, the carnal the physical, the earthly. And Jesus was trying to get them to lift their eyes up. Jesus was telling them, look at the spiritual realities all around you. Look at me. Look at what I'm providing. True life. And Jesus just lays it out right in front of them. You can either look for this physical food or you can look for the spiritual food. And as we'll say in John chapter 8, you get to choose life or you can die in your sins. Jesus just lays it out right in front of them. What are you going to choose? To be filled physically or to be filled spiritually? Physical life or eternal life? What do you want? What do you want? Is it money? Is, is it the perfect salary, the right amount that could satisfy us? Is it the, the right kind of house? the right kind of car, that then I would be filled. Is it some kind of power that that you're not content with just working for the company, you want to run the company, and and it's all just about how many people can be underneath you just because of the position? Is it influence? Is it how many followers you can have on social media? Is that what puts a smile on your face before your head hits the pillow? How many comments you can get on the post? Is it sex? Is it the perfect physical partner to meet all your physical needs? Is it the perfect-looking girl or being the perfect-looking girl? 
Is it food? Is your ideal life just anything you can eat whenever you want it? Is it safety? No more war, no more hurricanes. What do you want? Money? Power? Influence? Sex? Or do we just want Jesus? Do we just want Him? Do we want the one that has loved us so much? Do we want the one that's providing for us? Don't just see the miracle, see the sign. Jesus is offering you eternal life. Do we want Jesus? Why is he offering it? Why is he offering eternal life? Because we deserve it? No. No, he loves us so many times in spite of the fact that we don't deserve it. So many times we pick a million things over him. So many times I pick a million things over him. Is it so, well, then we can just kind of do whatever we want. So we can have a nice kind of whatever life now, but have hope for eternity? No. No, Jesus didn't come to fulfill our desires. He came to change them. He doesn't want us looking for the earthly life that we've always wanted, but the eternal life that we need. We talked about the crowd. Let's talk about their intention quickly. Notice what the crowd says to Jesus at the end of this, or what Jesus anticipates, that they wanted to force him to become their king, to force him to be king. If they force him to become king, who's really king? Not Jesus. <laughs> the, the people wanted to make a king in their own image, a, a king after their heart, after man's heart, a king for what they wanted, not what they needed. In a way, we don't really think about it this way, but the story is kind of a tragedy. Uh, you, you know, the, the feeding of the 5,000, it absolutely was a joyous occasion. It was a utopia for a moment. But then the people left. Jesus left them, and they left him. Why did they walk away? Why did they walk away at the end of chapter 6? It's because they didn't realize what Jesus was feeding them, and they didn't like the taste of it. What do you mean? Do you realize that there's actually two feedings of the 5,000 in John chapter 6? Did you miss the other one? Uh, if you have a Bible that you know, highlights the words Jesus in red, if, if you look at the first 15 verses, there's just a couple. Jesus just says a couple words. But for the rest of the chapter, it's like 90% red. Jesus is talking a lot. Jesus has left over to the other side of the sea, and the people have followed him over now, and they come to him, and Jesus feeds them again, not with bread, but with his words. And they don't like it. Jesus says, you must eat my flesh. You must eat my flesh. And what do the people do? do? Do they say, well, that sounds kind of weird, Jesus. I don't know about eating flesh. Will you kind of describe that for me? Let's kind of, you know, get, get this figured out. No, do, do they say, you know what? That, that's a hard saying. That's a hard saying, Jesus. But you just proved yourself to be the prophet. The prophet, not a prophet. But when the people said, this is the prophet, they recognized that this is a new Moses picture. This is the prophet that Moses prophesied about that would be like him, and that people should listen to him. Okay, this is a tough saying, but you've proven yourself, Jesus, so we'll stay with you. No. No, they walk away. Because Jesus said, no more bread. I'm done filling your bellies with bread. There's no more bread. And so they walked away. Jesus didn't come to deal with physical bread. Jesus didn't come to deal with our physical lives and to make our physical lives perfect. That's not what he was concerned about. He was concerned about something so much better, so much greater. How do you know that's not what he's concerned about? Jesus just told us in chapter 6. He's already shown it in, in John chapter 5. Do you remember that miracle where, where he heals the man at the pool of Bethesda? The text tells us that, that there was a multitude of people there, a multitude of sick people, invalids everywhere. They, they were everywhere, tons of them. But how many people does Jesus heal? Just one. Just one. Are you really Jesus? Are you discriminating Jesus? Are you unfair, Jesus? No. No, we're just blind. 
We saw the miracle, but we didn't see the sign. Jesus didn't come to heal the sickness in those people's bones. He came to heal the sickness in their hearts. Jesus is coming for something so much greater. And so he tells these people, no, you're not going to get any more bread. Only the bread of heaven. Jesus had his priorities straight. Do we? I hope you want to help the poor. I do. I do. I want to help the poor. Follow-up question. Who are the poor? Who are the poor? Who are they? Who is Jesus telling us the poor are? It's always going to feel good. It's always going to bring a smile to people's faces. People are always going to need physical bread and want physical bread until they don't. Until they don't need physical bread anymore. One day all the physical bread is going to be gone. And it's only going to be the bread of heaven, eternal life. Jesus taught us something that day. When you hand out physical bread, you become really popular sometimes. But when you hand out the bread of life, not so much. Can, can you imagine if people had iPhones that day and they were up on the mountain and then they, everyone was kind of, you know, taking pictures and videos while Jesus was handing out all the food? I mean, that was, I mean, this is great. We, look at Jesus. He, he's feeding everybody. We love Jesus. This is great. I love this Jesus. How many posts do you think were made on the other side of the sea when Jesus gave them the bread of heaven and talked to them about eternal life? What should Christians be more focused on today? If you knew, if you knew that Christ was coming back next week, what would you send out all the Christians with in their hand? Bread or a Bible? What do people need? What do they need? Jesus didn't come to just feed those that are hungry physically. Jesus came to feed those that are spiritually hungry, that are hungry for eternal life, that see him and recognize who he is, that see Jesus wants to give us something so much more than this world can offer, something that's so high above us, we have to lift our eyes up. You got to take it off the world. You got to take it off what's right in front of you. Even though sometimes you're in a barren land, even though you're in a wilderness, and there's all kinds of problems right in front of your face, and I wish I could have this, I wish I could have more, I wish I could have something different, but Jesus is offering you something. He's offering all of us something. Are you hungry? Are you hungry for true life, for eternal life? The crowd that day, they, they wanted a better life. But they didn't need a better life. They needed a new life. True life. Life in abundance. Eternal life. And that's what Jesus was offering. Jesus told a story about a young man, a young son, a prodigal son, that decided to leave home. And he, he wanted to see what all the world could give him. He wanted to be filled by everything the world had to offer him, every, everything this earth has to give. And he did it. He went. And he got a little taste of that. But then he ended up somewhere, somewhere lower than he'd ever been, completely unfulfilled, unsatisfied. He, he, was, looking at, he was in a pig pen. And he was looking at what the pigs were eating, and he thought, if I could just eat that, that would make my life better. Then he came to himself. And he said, I have a father that's at home with more than enough bread. And so he went home. He didn't eat the pods that the pigs were eating. He didn't stay in the muck of the world. He went home. If you're sick of being satisfied with what this world has to offer, come to Jesus because he's offering you something. He wants you to be filled with him when it seems like you're in a barren land. 
He wants to fill you with life and satisfy you with eternal life. That's John's message of feeding the 5,000. It's so important for us today. I thank you so much for your attention this morning. I, I love this group here. I love every single one of you. I love the efforts that we're making to serve our God. And we need reminders. We need reminders just like I need reminders that our home is not of this world, that we're going somewhere better, and that Jesus is offering us something better. We're going to close this hour of worship with a final prayer and a final song. And I ask if you will, let's go ahead and stand for that final prayer. Thank you. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.